Hello, I'm Tom Rothman, 20th Century Fox. Welcome to Fox Legacy. We're glad to have you with us. It's a good effort, Captain Tan. My next will be better, my fancy clown. Ah, Senor Toro, we meet again. I've spoken in past episodes of the legacy of the old Hollywood studio system that reigned from its founding in the silent era up through its decay in the 1950s and eventual total dissolution in the early 60s. It's to me one of the most fascinating aspects of comparing my job with the job of various of my predecessors from those eras. The ends are exactly the same. Make hits, baby. And make more hits than you make flops, plain and simple. But the means of accomplishing that task, trust me, much harder than it looks, they are totally different. In the studio system, everyone, everyone, from the above-the-line creative talent, which means actors, writers, directors, to the below-the-line technical grips, electricians, directors of photography, all the prop makers, they all work for the studio under long-term employment contracts. Today, none of these people do. They must all be hired on a per-picture basis, if you can. For you see, there's the rub. When a star worked for you permanently, he or she, at least theoretically, did the movies the studio wanted them to do. Today's stars do the movies they want to do. It's a total inversion of the buyer-seller relationship. For a thorough look at how the old system worked, I recommend, actually, a book called The Genius of the System by Thomas Schultz. And also, you could go check out the Fox Legacy episode we did on Love is a Many Splendored Thing. That was a true studio system picture, and we analyzed it from that point of view. For tonight's subject, however, all you really need to know are two crucial facts. First, in that studio system era, the success of a company was largely defined by the success of its contract players. The better the studio's eyes at spotting talent early, and the better use to which that talent was put, the better the results. Those were in the days when we made up to 70 movies a year. No one could put together that many movies each year now, assembling the talent for every film from scratch. And second, the relationship between a studio and a contract star was a little like the story marriage in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Symbiotic and interdependent, full of love, but also hate, gratitude and resentments, passionate and volatile, and ultimately, always, somehow or another, eventually impermanent. In the history of 20th Century Fox, there is no better example of this than the marriage spanning 19 years and 39 movies between my legendary predecessor, Daryl Zanuck, and Fox's most consistent, most enduring, most successful male contract star, Tyrone Power III. You have no doubt heard the expression for scions of the aristocracy to the manor born, they say. Well, if anyone was to the actor star manor born, and as you will hear in the end of this full circle tale, to the manor died, it was Tyrone Power. Born Tyrone Edmund Power III on May 5th, 1914 in Cincinnati, Ohio, he came from a family with a storied acting career. His great-grandfather, Tyrone Power I, had been an acclaimed Irish comedian in Dublin and, in 1833, became one of the first European actors to tour the United States. His father, Frederick Tyrone Power II, performed with Sir Henry Irving in England and later established himself on Broadway as a prominent Shakespearean. His mother was also an actress, and Power II wanted his son to embrace the family business. So instead of attending college, he trained to be a Shakespearean actor. While just in his teens, Ty appeared alongside his father in a Chicago production of The Merchant of Venice. Later, Ty followed his father to Hollywood, hoping to find work, while Power II acted in an early talkie, The Miracle Man, 
The shoot on that film was so exhausting that Ty's father collapsed on set and died in his son's arms in 1931. Remember that for when we come to the end of our story. Over the next few years, success in Hollywood didn't follow, so Ty went east to Broadway. By 1936, his career there started to take off, and as still happens, that's when Hollywood came calling. Daryl Zanuck sent a scout to find some new talent on Broadway. As a result, Ty Power got a screen test. Watching the footage, Zanuck said these profound words, take it off, he looks like a frightened monkey. <laughs> now fortunately, we executives know it's a good thing to listen to the advice of others too, especially our wives. And Zanuck was smart enough to listen to his wife, Virginia. A little makeover to his hair and bushy eyebrows, Virginia thought, and this handsome young man could have a future. Zanuck went along, shipped power out to Hollywood for a second screen test, this time along with established star Alice Bay. Well, Alice Bay thought that Tyrone Power was the single handsomest man she had ever met. A pattern was starting to emerge. Women seemed to like this young guy far more than men. Faye talked Zanuck into hiring Power in his first real movie role in the musical Sing Baby Sing. But that director didn't think much of Power's acting, so he shot a few scenes and then Zanuck yanked him out. Faye persisted, and Zanuck gave him another chance with a tiny role in the film Girls' Dormitory. What will it take to cheer you up? A diamond bracelet? A million francs? Or a dance with me? It caused women to swoon in preview audiences. The reaction was a revelation for Zanuck, so he signed Tyrone Power to a seven-year contract. Now, often movie actors have an appeal that's stronger to one sex or another. You can have female stars who women love but not men, and the same is true for male stars. To cross over to superstardom, you have to appeal to both men and women. And for a man, become someone about whom it was immortally said of Sean Connery's James Bond, for example, that women want to be with him and men want to be him. The greatest male stars, Clark Gable, Steve McQueen, Paul Newman, managed both. Some, like Robert Redford and Brad Pitt and Cary Grant, began as stars for women and then evolved to appeal to both sexes. Such was the case with Tyrone Power, who in the beginning was all matinee idol all the time. At that early stage, an actor like Ty was beholden to work only for Fox. Most new contract players would endure a few middling roles, but not Ty. Instead, he went straight for one of the most successful directors on the lot, the legendary Henry King, and lobbied him for a role in his next picture, Lloyd's of London. King gave him a screen test for the lead role, even though that role had already been cast with Ty's close friend, Don Amici. Everybody on Zanuck's team preferred Amici, but Zanuck was starting to see that Tyrone had breakout potential, and he gave him the role. While they were shooting, Zanuck told Henry King, take all the time you need with that boy, because if you can keep him all the way through the picture as he is up till now, he'll be a star. And the film did indeed make Ty a star. He received a flood of fan mail from amorous females, and he was off. Zanuck put him to work in five films in 1937. Can you imagine one actor today being in five films in the same year? But remember, in 1937, before TV, Hollywood made over 600 films compared to the 150 or so made in this year. Zanuck thought Ty's acting to be somewhat, shall we say, limited. He remarked it couldn't have happened to a duller guy. Ty was the matinee idol not a serious actor like Olivier, or at least that's what Zanuck first thought, but a surprising game changer came in the 1937 film In Old Chicago, with Ty in the role of a corrupt politician. Zanuck initially didn't want him in the role. He wanted Clark Gable, the marquee, lovable rogue of that era, but director Henry King prevailed, influencing Zanuck to change his mind. And Zanuck was starting to realize that Tyrone Power could do just about anything. Maybe there was some real talent in there after all. Why, that's dirty. Why did they stop it? Come out, Barnes. Well, I heard about you and Jack fighting. She left the land in there, and Daisy kicked it over. But I thought Jack did it to burn out the patch. That mob thinks so, too. Come on, we got to get to him. They'll kill him. Well, where is he? I don't know, but we've got to get back and stop that mob at the what? Senate. With Power's career skyrocketing, he received elite treatment that very few contract players got to enjoy. 
He enjoyed the perks, chauffeured limousine. Zanuck usually kept at arm's length from his actors, but he actually became friends with Ty and they started to socialize. Zanuck even let Ty use the executive steam room. Interestingly, that steam room is directly below my partner, Jim Giannopoulos' office, which takes up about one-fifth of what used to be Zanuck's massive suite of offices. And there's still a secret door that leads directly down to what used to be a swimming pool and a club room. Those are gone, replaced by a small gym, but the steam room still remains. Those stairs, by the way, also, allegedly, represent a different part of the bygone culture of studio system, where the casting couch was a fact of life and the objectification of women the accepted cultural norm. I have no proof, so I shan't repeat the stories of what went on down there with Mr. Z, but I can't say I doubt them very much either. I can say that with our company now, whose four major production divisions are all run by women, and which benefits from the skill and passion of female executives at every level, I am glad those days are gone. In any case, in addition to lavishing Tyrone with perks, Zanuck also gifted him with some coveted roles that he cherished, like the lead in The Reigns King. But with success can also come resentment. And the other side of the studio system's dual-edged sword was starting to fall on Ty. He greatly respected the old man, as Zanuck was known, but he also felt like he wasn't letting him do more roles that might bring him up to the level of the Shakespearean actor he was trained to be. There were too many two-bit parts, like the appropriately named second fiddle, that didn't fuel Tyrone's artistic fire. And especially as power approached the zenith of his success, the pendulum power started to shift ever so slightly in his direction. He convinced his boss to cast him in a meaty role in Johnny Apollo. But then Zanuck put him in a genre for which he would be forever identified and ironically achieve his greatest commercial success, the swashbuckler. The mark of Zorro was the first of many Another nail in the velvet coffin. Ah, the captain's blade is not so firm. It's still firm enough to run you through. I needed that scratch to awaken me. Without great roles to challenge him, Ty's creative eye naturally wandered, now back to the stage. He and Fox director Ruben Mamoulian wanted to do a play. Zanuck wouldn't tolerate his major star taking a sabbatical, so he assigned both his actor and the director to make a movie instead, 1941's Blood and Sand. That might not have excited Ty creatively, but it did provide one of the most iconic moments of his career, that of him as the handsome matador in the ring. He learned how to be a bullfighter, but Zanuck didn't let him go near the bulls. He let a stunt double do that. Tyrone was far too precious a commodity to be placed in any real danger. Eventually, Power felt that he had suffered long enough, and he openly defied his boss by refusing to star in the light comedy Brooklyn Bridge. Zanuck retaliated. He refused to lend Ty out to Warner Brothers for a plum role in 1942's King's Row. Well, one spouse yells, the other spouse throws a plate, and the battle goes on. It was around this time, though, that Ty's first seven-year contract with Fox expired. He was, albeit briefly, a free man. Interestingly, though, instead of trying his hand in another studio or taking a shot as a freelancer, for all his chafing, it's telling to me that Power wanted a renewal. He tried to get more leeway to do some stage plays and a few films from other studios. Fox only yielded on a few of Ty's key concessions. His movies would be limited to two a year for Fox, and he'd get story approval. But he was still banned from working for other studios. But the compromises left a bitter taste in his mouth. What stinking sons of bitches all those bastards are, he said. Nice. Love and hate. Power probably could have found peace as Fox's most popular contract player. However, Xanax reach extended way past his professional career and deep into Tyrone's bedroom as well. Early on in his career, Tyrone had started dating Loretta Young after the two of them were cast in Love is News. But Zanuck didn't approve of the pairing, and he influenced Ty to break it off, which he soon did. That's not something I have much to say about these days. 
Tyrone was too young, Zanuck felt, to become tied down in the eyes of his female following. In some regard, this suited Power's style just fine. He himself admitted that, quote, the things I love most in life, alas, are immoral, illegal, or unvirtuous. And he got around, believe me, from Lana Turner to Judy Garland. He dated Olympic skater Sonia Henning, who had recently become a movie star herself. Zana cast them together in thin ice to try to turn their sparks into box office. Zanuck's meddling in his personal affairs frustrated Ty increasingly, especially when he finally decided to become serious about a woman. Zanuck might have regretted putting Tyrone in the picture Suez because on set, Ty met an actress who went by one name, Annabella. Zanuck tried to split them up by getting Annabella to shoot on location in London. She refused, so he promptly suspended her, ruining her acting career in the process. Zanuck next sent Power to Missouri to shoot Jesse James and kept Annabella off the set. She complied, but only because she flew to France to get a divorce from her husband so she could marry Tyrone. Zanuck next tried to have his publicity chief, Harry Brand, intervene. Brand, a famous old Hollywood fixer, influenced Ty's mother into believing that Annabella was ruining her son's career. Ty's mother then implored her son not to marry her, but he paid no heed with best man Don Amici, whose party had stolen, by his side, and Zanuck nowhere in sight, Ty and Annabella got married, breaking the hearts of young women all over the country. Ty knew he was defying the old man, but he was on a hot streak and thought he could get away with it. And, for a time, he did. His next film, Rose of Washington Square, was a hit. So, maybe it wasn't so bad he was married after all. His female audience didn't seem to mind. In fact, some of his biggest hits were yet to come. Eventually, Annabella would leave, citing incompatibility of careers. And in 1949, Power married actress Linda Christian. Zanuck didn't like this marriage either. But by then, Ty's career was beginning to wane, so Zanuck was less motivated to do anything about it. Instead, he had the Fox PR team overhype it as the wedding of the century. Tyrone Power's career had reached its peak, with the tipping point being 1946, The Razor's Edge. That was a critical and popular hit, but accolades would flow to his co-stars, Ann Baxter, she won an Academy Award, and not to him. Oscar glory would forever elude Tyrone Power. Next, the 1947 swashbuckler, Captain from Castile, underperformed. And Tyrone's personal favorite film of that year, Nightmare Alley, a meaty role about a sideshow worker that he had begged Zanuck to play, also flopped. By the late 1940s, other stars were in ascendance at Fox. Gregory Peck, Richard Widmark, and Fox's new swashbuckler, Cornell Wilde. Ty was getting a bit too old to be a matinee idol, his box office sheen a little too dull. The public, in its unrelenting march, moved on to the next newest best thing. In 1952, Tyrone's contract with Fox expired again, and this time he let it lapse. Since a string of failures like the Black Rose, he was not getting choice roles or the movie star treatment that he was accustomed to. Parting was such sweet sorrow. They got so used to seeing me around Fox, he said, that they counted me in the annual inventory of props. It was a unique time for Ty, no longer under Zanuck's control. When he married his third wife, Deborah Ann Menardos, no one objected. A happy thought, but that also meant that no one thought it would hurt his career because there wasn't much left to hurt. Still, it was a thrilling time creatively for Ty, working with John Ford on Columbia's The Long Gray Line. His character aged 50 years during the movie. He said, Zanuck would never have permitted me to age at all in any movie. There is a final ironic act to the long marriage and divorce of Tyrone Power and Daryl Zanuck. They were not quite done with each other. In 1956, Zanuck himself left Fox because, as the studio system began to unravel, he thought being a studio chief wasn't omnipotent anymore. He was right about that. He believed he'd have more creative control as an independent producer. He was wrong about that. So he formed his own production company. He was producing a filmed version of Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, directed by Henry King. Zanuck offered Ty the leading role. Ty, now a free agent, 
got $275,000 for the role the same as what he had made for a whole year in the prime of his career at Fox. The two actually got along well during the shoot, but it didn't take much for them to gripe at each other. You see, there was a young actor hired in the movie to amp up the sex appeal, with Ty and his co-star, the other major swashbuckler of that day, Errol Flynn, being considered too long in the tooth. Ty knew he had grown too old to be the sex symbol. He said once, you can kid everybody but the fellow you shave in the morning. But Ty thought that this other young actor, Robert Evans, was so bad that he was ruining the picture. You tell fortunes? Sometimes. Do you mind? No, I, I like it. Tell me that I will live for always and I will be a millionaire. Do you see any bulls in my head? Oh, yes, thousands of them. Good. He tried to have Evans fired. But Zanuck chomped on his cigar and famously said, the kid stays in the picture. Bob Evans went on to have a very successful career, by the way, but not as an actor. Zanuck was dead wrong about that. But that's a story for another studio to tell. The Sun Also Rises would prove to be Zanuck and Power's swan song together. Ty completed only one more film, Billy Wilder's Witness for the Prosecution, which along with Black Swan, is my own personal favorite Tyrone Power film. While making King Vidor's Bible epic, Solomon and Sheba, Ty was in the midst of one of his now famous sword fights with George Sanders, who played the villain. Ty stopped the scene, staggered, and said to Vidor, I'm sorry, I can't go on, I'm not feeling well. Tyrone Power suffered a heart attack and died soon after. Think of that. He died just exactly as his father did, collapsing on a film set. Talk about predetermination. He was, quite tragically, only 44 years old. Tyrone Power lived most of his professional life trapped by the confines of the very system that gave him his career. It was no doubt a vexing dilemma for him. His legacy in film was not exactly all he wanted it to be. He received no awards, had no nominations. His highest accolade was a posthumous star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, which I promise you is not all it's cracked up to be. But if the People's Choice Awards had been given then, he would have won it year in and year out. Still in all, he was dissatisfied with the majority of the movies he made over the course of his career. The only really great things, he said, are born out of pain, I'm afraid. It's maddening, he went on, that life has to be that way, but it seems to be so. So true. But in the end, to me, I think the scales tipped in Tyrone Power's favor. He created a legacy on screen and off. He became an icon, one of the most popular film actors of his day, in partnership with his nemesis, Daryl Zanuck, but Zanuck had the wisdom to see past his first impressions and give the handsome young man the chance he needed to become a star. It would be easy to say that movie stars were manufactured back then, like cars or candy or bars of soap. But then and now, it always takes something extra, that fleeting ability to make audiences feel. And trust me, no system can manufacture that. God makes some men run faster, some jump higher, think quicker than all others, and he makes some movie stars. Fittingly, on Tyrone Power's grave are the masks of comedy and tragedy, along with the inscription that reads, Good night, sweet prince. Indeed, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. <laughs>